All right, Dark Souls enthusiasts, Fritz here. Let's talk about core strategies behind this amazing game. Praise the sun. So the first thing that I look at in terms of Dark Souls, playing with a group. Solo is a little bit different. You can set it up at your gaming table, at your workbench, and kind of spend a couple of days or a week or really unlimited time working through. But the first thing that I find is that when I'm playing it with a group and we have a set time, usually this is at the gaming club or at the store where, hey, we have three hours to play, that is going to set the pace for the grind. Do you have a set time to play or do you have, in theory, an unlimited time to play? As a group, if it's unlimited time, well, look, obviously you're going to use the maximum amount of sparks. And you're going to gear up the best that you can. And then you're going to make your run for the mini boss or follow up on the main boss on there. I find that when we're under a hard timer, that's where the tactics change. And in Dark Souls, there's this duality of a lot of players seem to think that some of the encounters are too easy. Well, ultimately, if I have unlimited grinding time, I'm going to grind the best that I can. That's going to give me... The, bo- the most gear, the most possibilities, whether I'm two players, three or four. I find that at a certain point through the game, you get just good enough where you can control the random. You've got uh, different colored dice. You've got enough dice to throw up there. You've got ways to mitigate life and stamina, regain that. And if your tactics are sound, you should be able to make a run against the boss. If you fail it, Well, then you can respawn because you haven't used all your sparks and you can run again. So what I find in playing with um, a group is we like to set it where if we have three hours to play or two hours, whatever it is, the first hour and a half will be grinding and then we leave half an hour for the boss fight. I like to leave a little bit more time if we're going on a timer because often it's going to be at the end of the evening and it heightens this awareness because we only have one shot. Only one shot, then we're going to be out of time. So we want to go a little bit slower, we want to talk, we want to see. So that's the first thing going in. What is the pace of the game? The second thing that I find is, and we're talking about stock rules. I'm not house ruling the blacksmith. I'm not house ruling uh, souls. We're going right in straight from the book, rules as written. I believe in house rules, if that's something you want to do with your gaming group, but I feel like in posting Tactica and exploring board games, I want to go with the stock rules because, well, that's what I play, but also I don't want to impose my own house rules and offer tactics here, and you might be going by the rule book, or you might be doing something a little bit different on here. So I believe in in the core. So looking at this right away, yes, you are at the mercy of the random draw item deck, and There are a lot of items in there. It's a pretty thick deck. Some are useful right away, some not so useful. And if we're talking about just the core set without the expansions, example, uh, there's a number of sorcerer class type items in there, which realistically only the assassin can equip. You can turn the assassin in the core set. You can turn the assassin to kind of a techno mage. And it's really assassin techno mage. It's a lot of fun to play. I enjoy it. But in order to utilize kind of the sorcerer subset items, then you're giving up dodge. You're giving up a lot of the assassin abilities in there, going into that kind of of training tree and item tree on there. So you realize right away that not all of the items are intended for all the characters, and there's almost this assumption that there are expansions. So the frustration that I see some players play is that I'm the warrior, right? You go into you go into the game with your mind as a warrior. And maybe this is where the designers kept the Dark Souls feel much like the video games. And if you're not from the Souls franchise, maybe you're not picking up on this. You don't understand the background currency here. But in Dark Souls, you create a character. You start out as that character. But that's really just in name only where your primary attributes are, are stacked, are weighted. Through the course of the game, you have the freedom to develop your character into anything. You could start out as a knight and then wind up as kind of like a, a magic user on there or kind of a, a knight type heavy armor rogue in there. In the board game itself, you go in, this seems to, be, seems to be this preconception that I'm the warrior, so I will only develop as a warrior. You might not have time with that. You might draw different types of gear, different types of items that take your warrior in a different direction. So what I find is that the players need to be open based on their starting characters 
as they draw gear, as they draw items to see your character might develop in ways that you want to take advantage of that you weren't planning, that wasn't expected. So while it has this role-playing-esque type feel, you know, I'm playing the knight. I'm going to role-play a knight. My knight, based on the dictations of the draw, might go in a slightly different direction. And that's a lot of fun because, well, you can play the game again and again, but you really don't know where you're going to go or what you're going to do. So building on this, let's talk about attributes versus items and farming. Now, obviously, if you, you lay out your tiles, you lay out your encounter levels based on the mini boss or the main boss you're fighting, and that first reveal is really going to tell you a lot on there. It helps tremendously if you're capable of drawing one of the tiles with a chest on it. If you can get one, I assume based on the randomness of the cards, I'm not giving away any spoilers here, I'm not going to give the exact numbers, safe to say you're going to get at least one. So that's two items, that's essentially two free souls. That's, that's not bad, right, on that. So two free items is two free souls, which means you get two items that you don't, you know, right, you're opening the treasure chest. You don't have to spend those two souls to get two items. So essentially, two free items and a stat one bump on there. That's a huge advantage. If you're able to, with the tile layout and the random draw, get two treasure chests or three, only one game I got three, that's going to give you a, a tremendous, tremendous bump. So as you draw those chests, consider the souls that you've now earned from defeating the room that are saved, throwing them into stat bumps. What I like to do at the beginning of the game, so we're playing a three or a four player game, we clear the first room, we've got a number of souls. I want to spend half the souls, well really I like to draw in, in banks of two. I like to draw two cards and see, two item cards, see, can I use them right now? If so, equip. If I can't use them right now, based on if it's a mini boss or a main boss and my current stats, can I devote souls into stats to bump them up to use it? Is it realistic? Some items, just the cost to use them going against the mini boss, it's going to take me too long to stat level. So kind of those go on kind of a discard type pile. I'm not going to put anything into them. I like to draw two, see where I stand, maybe bump up an attribute. Draw two. See where I stand? Bump up an attribute. So essentially with every run, it's going to be spending half on items, half on leveling attributes. Now if there's something that, if there's an item that someone can use, because it's communal, right? I like to give it to that player. We like to put it on our dashboard as a reminder of what we're working for. And this I find is key because you are up against a hard timer. You're up against the souls. You're up against how many runs you have, how many rooms you can clear, what you're going to do. You might get to a point where you don't want to necessarily clear a room if you're in the campaign and you're going to dash through on there. So as you acquire items, your item deck builds really, really, really fast. And it's hard to keep track of the stuff you may use, you're not going to use, what's on a side pile to use. So I find even if you can't equip it, and you're working towards it, it helps for the party to look and say, hey, this is ownership. You're going to work towards this item. Here you go. Hold it. Keep it visual. It's right there, literally in front, as we move ahead. So that kind of 50-50. Now let's talk about character party development or the optimal, what I feel, is a way to develop a party. And this really depends on your, your gaming group. I'm offering my experience. Some players, and there is no right or wrong, I feel, it's, I feel the best thing is when you go into starting a board game to know the expectations of the players. Some people are very competitive. I've played a couple of games with Dark Souls with my more uh, war game inclined friends, and they approach it from a min-max war game. What are the best characters? What's the best strategy? Where are we going to go? So we optimize the character playing based on two players, three players, or four players. That's what we're going to look at. But certainly... I believe in board gaming, a social, a narrative thing. You're going to be playing for a while. The game's going to turn out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Play the character you want to be. So if playing a certain character combo is less than optimal, I think that's more important if someone can have fun playing what they want to play, having that ownership. They will make better tactical decisions. If I really want to play the knight, and you're like, Fritz, we already have the tank covered. It's a three-player game. We've got the tank covered. Right, someone's already playing the warrior, so you got to play the herald for support, or you got to play the assassin. If you assign me the herald, is my heart really going to be into it? Right? Okay, yeah, it's kind of cool. I'm playing, but every other turn, I'm going to be thinking, hmm, 
I really wanted to play the knight on that. It's better to play the character class you want to play. Someone else wants to play because they're going to be passionate about it. They're going to be in there thinking about it, formulating combos, working out there. Overall, it's going to be better for the party. But if you have players that are open to playing, this is my suggestion. For a two-player game, I go with either the warrior or the knight. Usually the knight slightly winning out because it's got better armor possibilities. And then the herald is a backup tank. And the herald for buffs, heals, bumping up stats as you get gear. In a three-player game, I find it best to go knight, warrior, herald. You're going to need those two tanks because now the minions have more activations. You're going to need soakage. You're going to need someone to take that damage. Also, between their activations more every turn coming at you, you're going to need to throw out more damage every single turn. When you get into three characters, I find that the two tanks, they need to drop a minion. Sentinel, you probably not drop it a Sentinel a turn until later in the game. And then there's multiples of them. They're kind of uh, aside. But you need to be able to easily drop a hollow. You need to easily be able to drop a knight every turn on there. So you need two on there and then the herald to buff. And then obviously in a four-player game, the assassin. Why do I say the assassin last? Because certainly I know there's a lot of players out there. And the assassin is my favorite character. I solo the assassin all the time. I would want to play the assassin if you gave me a choice. But the reason why I say the assassin last in the list... And the game is made for four players. There is an assumption in the game that while it scales down... You know, one player, two players, three players... There is the assumption that there are four characters on the board, whether that's one player each controlling a character or you're running solo and you're you're controlling four or it's three of us and someone doubles up. There there is that, that assumption going in there. But the reason why I say the assassin is last is looking at the core. Again, there are a number of items that you're going to draw that are not optimal to pick but the only character that can use them, maybe primarily this mage type class, till so we get a proper sorcerer out there or a proper magic user type class out there, the assassin's going to want to utilize it. And since you're up to against the randomness of the draw, again, if I start drawing stuff and I draw um, firebomb, I draw some of the spells, I draw some of the the buffs. I want to take advantage of that magic. I I do because I've spent my souls, the limited currency of my souls, and I just happen to get a magic-heavy deck. I'm going to go in with the assassin. That's going to take him away from his primary focus. Second, I find that dodge is hit or miss. It, 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 It is all or nothing. And certainly early on with the shield or a buckler or some sort of dodge bonus there, some sort of dodge bonus on the armor, plus maybe you've got your luck reroll. You're going to make that dodge bonus. You are. So you're going to run around whacking things. When, you're, when your life and stamina start to meet, you've got a dodge you can do. Also, you're going to invoke your special ability as the rogue. Excuse me, as the assassin on there. Rogue, assassin, 50-50, same thing. I find, though, that you start sinking gears, uh, gear and souls into dodge, and it is the weakest end game. That's not, it, not, well, let me rephrase that. Not that it's weak. Because it is very powerful because you can quickly dodge, unlock your special ability. That's a great riposte against the boss monsters on there. But it is all or nothing. And do you want to gamble all or nothing? And some of the higher monsters and bosses, the dodge starts stacking up. And you can't be taking that dodge every single turn. Where armor, you start beefing up your armor... You can take that. You know, I'm going to roll. I'm going to roll three blacks. I'm going to roll one blue. I might get an orange in there. You're, you're going to have a good stack of dice. Where even if you're getting hit every turn, you know you're going to soak absorb what half or seventy percent of that damage. It's a lot easier to control the random. You're up against the random with the assassin. So for that reason, I mean, he's a lot of fun to play. But that's why, for that reason, I would say he would be last choice. Obviously, in a four-player game or a full group, he's going to be included. But two players, three players, I would look at Warrior Knight. I would look at Herald. So your thoughts, your comments, your feedback, because I love Dark Souls. I love unlocking the strategies. I love seeing what do we get for this run. Not only the rooms, what they're going to spawn, but what items are we going to get? What gear 
are we going to get? It's it's a lot of fun in that package, but definitely, 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 I find that there is a strategy, and we need to utilize that strategy because much like the video game, it's going to punish you. This game doesn't care. I mean, you open it up, and it tells you you're already dead. Might as well close the box and go back home. No baby talk here, no baby steps. I find this game to be very, very interesting, intriguing, and challenging. You need to know what you're getting involved with and what you're getting into.